All right, so in this video, we're going to review some problems looking at work, kinetic energy, and GP. Uh, so we're going to look at some basic uh, questions. First of all, looking at calculating kinetic energy, so we can pick up a few key things. Uh, so first off, uh, remembering that mass must be in kilograms if we're using it in an equation. Uh, so that's what we've got there. And the other thing being something that's going to be common across all the questions is getting the number of significant figures right. So 100 is a three significant figure number, 30 is a two significant figure number, so we give the answer to the smallest number of significant figures, which is two. Uh, so that's why we've given it as 45. Uh, for this next one, we've got a 50 kilogram runner doing a 100 meter race in four minutes. So the first thing we can do is calculate how fast they're going using speed equals distance over time. And we are assuming that their velocity or speed is constant throughout, I guess. And then once we've got that, we can plug that into the equation. And again, recognizing we need to give a two significant figure answer to this question. A 500 car tra traveling at two minutes a second, uh, that's nice and easy. Uh, so again, a two significant figure answer would be appropriate here. And you'll notice that typically I give my answers in standard form. It makes giving the right number of significant figures very straightforward. Okay, so again, some basic questions calculating change in gravitational potential energy. Uh, so change in GP is calculated by doing mg delta h. Uh, the G we're going to be using at this level is now 9.81, so no more using 10 as G. Um, and it's going above the ground, so we should end up with a positive number at the end, because the 1.5 meters is upwards. And again, two significant figures would be appropriate here, because the 50 and the 1.5 are two significant figure numbers. It doesn't matter that the 9.81 is 3, uh, it's the lowest one we go with. Uh, next one, again, it's moving upwards, so we'd expect a positive answer to the question. And we've got a four significant figure number and a three significant figure number, so we're going to give our answer to three significant figures as well. Again, this last one, again, it's going upwards, so we expect a positive number. Um, again, remembering we have to convert mass into kilograms before we can use this equation, and in this case, two significant figures is appropriate. Okay, so we're going to take a little sidestep at this point and look at some of the techniques that we're using and when it's appropriate to use them. So these are all things that you'll have met at GCSE, but it's about thinking about when it's appropriate to use them. So we've got um, some we, we've got or we want to know what's going on based on the time and uh, during a situation. So when we're doing energy transformations like con uh, conservation of energy and kinetic energy to GP, in all of those equations, we never really think about time. So conservation of energy is not a tool to be using when you want to know the time something happens or how long it takes, that kind of thing. So that's where Subat equations and forces are appropriate, which you may or may not have met before. If you haven't met them, they'll come later on. So if we're dealing with collisions or explosions, this is where the laws of conservation, momentum and impulse, which you'll have learned about at GCSE, are useful. So whenever you have collisions or explosions, you should be thinking conservation of momentum, that kind of thing. And when you're given the initial conditions and you want to know about the final ones, that's where energy transformations and work done are useful because those methods don't care what happens in the middle. It's about what do we start with and then what's the end like? That's what conservation of energy and work are all about. Okay, so now we're going to look at some energy transformations that are occurring. So uh, we're going to be writing some expressions of the energy transfer. So we've got a rock that hits a surface of a liquid because it's splashing and then continues to sink. So if it hits the surface, it's going to be having some sort of kinetic energy to start with and it's going downwards. So it's going to have some sort of change in GP. And then 
afterwards what we're going to have well it's still going to it's still sinking so it's still going to have some kinetic energy but we've also going to have some work done by the surface of the liquid um, as it actually collides so a gun powered rocket launched from the ground to its peak height so gunpowder is a form of chemical potential energy so that's our starting point at its peak height i'm imagining it going straight upwards it's going to have no kinetic energy it's going to have stopped but it's going to have some gravitational potential energy but we're also going to do some work against air resistance and we're going to also produce some thermal energy as a result of the gunpowder burning itself so our car slowing down from 50 to 30 miles per hour so we've got some kinetic energy at the start, we've still got some kinetic energy at the end, and we're going to do some work by resistive forces at some point. A catapult propelling rock against wind. So a catapult starts with elastic potential energy. Uh, it's going to make the rock move, so it's going to give that some kinetic energy. The catapult itself would be propelled backwards, and so it will have some kinetic energy in the catapult as well. And we're going to have some work done by resistive forces, mostly air resistance. A pan of water being heated by both a flame and a paddle wheel, but losing some heat to the surroundings. So with the, the flame, we're burning something, so that's taking some chemical potential energy. The paddle wheel is also going to be doing some work, or we could also represent that as kinetic energy if we wanted. And we're heating something, so what we're doing is we're increasing the internal energy, and we're doing it of both the water and also the surroundings there. So when something's temperature is rising, uh, we describe that as, or being heated, as an internal energy rise. Okay, so a car of 1,500 kilograms traveling at 20 meters per second breaks to a stop in 100 meters. Calculate the change in kinetic energy of a car. It's going from 20 meters per second to a stop, so zero. Uh, so we're going to do final minus the initial, and we should end up with a negative number because the kinetic energy is decreasing. So, and giving that to two significant figures would be appropriate here. So with a change, it's always final minus initial. That's something to remember. So bearing in mind the law of conservation of energy, uh, we're not changing the height or the shape or anything like that. So what we're doing is we're doing some work in order to change the kinetic energy. So the work done must be exactly the same. And that work done would be done by the frictional force from the brakes. Work done, as long as the force is constant, is calculated like this. So we're going to get our force as minus 3 times center 3. It's minus because it's acting against the motion of the object. Uh, so we would give that a minus sign. Uh, again, so we've got it's an 80 kilogram moving along horizontal, so no change in GPE. And we've got a change in its speed. Find the force. So again, it's final minus initial. This time we're going to get a positive number because it's increasing speed. And then once we know the change in kinetic energy, we can then calculate the force using assuming. When we say find the average force, what we're asking is what force, if it were constant the whole time, would produce that change in kinetic energy. Uh, so that's what we get. Okay, so next one, we're doing a tennis player's follow through. So we've got uh, the distance is in contact, and we've got the spinal speed, we've got the mass, what is the force? So again, it's a very similar question. We're going to get a positive change in kinetic energy because we're increasing the speed. Uh, we know the distance, the force is applied, so we can get the force there. Uh, so these questions are all very similar. Um, so a peregrine falcon dives vertically on their prey with speeds of 30 meters per second. What height must the falcon dive from to achieve this speed? Uh, so I'm going to assume that we're not doing any work, so there's no friction or anything like that involved. Uh, so what we can do is we can move delta GP to the other side and equate that to delta kinetic energy and then substitute in the equations. That's what I've done there. And then once we've done that, we can rearrange delta H to make it the subject. And it should turn out to be a negative number because it's going downwards so hopefully that makes sense but the assumption we're making you can see it in the question above we are assuming there's no work done by air resistance or anything like that 
So a shot put of mass 7.3 kilograms is flown vertical upwards with a speed of 5 meters per second. Calculate initial kinetic energy, uh, hopefully very straightforward, uh, just using the equation that we've got. So it's released from 2.1 meters above the ground. What is the maximum height? So what we're going to do is we're going to equate in the same way that we did before. So we're going to assume no work done by a resistance minus delta GP is equal to delta kinetic energy. You can rearrange that to get delta H. And then that's going to be upwards because if kinetic energy is decreasing, that must be increasing the GP. So it's going upwards. So therefore, our final height would be the initial height plus the change. And what speed does the shot hit the ground? So we're going to use the same process here uh, but with slightly different form we know the starting height we just calculated it is like 3.37 blah, blah 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 so we make v the subject put the numbers in and we can get the speed it hits the ground okay so we've got a skydiver step from a balloon at a height of 2000 meters and accelerates downward the speed is 52 meters per second at a height of 500 meters so you can see we've come downwards 1500 meters. He then opens the parachute from 400 meters to the ground level. He falls at constant speed. And we've got the mass of the skydiving equipment. Uh, so first of all, we want the change in GP. Uh, so we know the height change. So and we know the mass. So we know what G is. So that can we know the GP is decreased by 1.4 times 10 to the sixth. Kinetic energy. At that point, well, we know the speed, so we can calculate what the kinetic energy is here. We're not going to assume all the GP is turned into kinetic energy because we've not been given any information to assume that. And we should know that air resistance will be doing a lot of work on a skydiver, so that it's not a valid assumption that GP turns into kinetic energy, or at least all of it. So that's why they're not equal, because we're going to have some work done by air resistance in this case. Okay, so looking at a final question, which is a, a more challenging version of these conversions of energies. So we've got a skier starting from rest, going down a 25 degree slope for 100 meters. Uh, first of all, draw a diagram. So that's what I've done there. And what I've done is I've calculated uh, the important one is going to be the height change, because that's what we're going to need for GP. So I've just used a bit of trigonometry. Uh, using the sine and the cosine uh, of the angle to figure out what those sides are. So that's how I've got the 100 sine 25 or 100 cosine 25. I've used sine theta is equal to um, opposite over hypotenuse and cosine theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse to get those. So the energy transformation occurring, well, we're clearly taking GPE and we're turning some of it into kinetic energy and some of it we're going to be doing work against resistive forces and we're going to try and figure out what that force is. So um, that's the last stage. So I'm going to use this expression for conservation of energy. And what we know is that the initial speed is zero. So we're not going to be subtracting a U squared. So that's why that's not in there. And then what we can do is we can plug in the values. So the height change is 100 sine 25. So that's gone in for delta H. The mass we don't know, but we know the final speed. So we can put all that together and get an expression for the work done. And then all we have to do is then divide by the distance. So frictional force would be acting parallel to the slope, which is why the distance is 100 in this case. And then we can calculate that in terms of m, so it comes out as about minus 2.1 m, and that completes section A of this uh, energy booklet.